So as Abhay mentioned, you know, I, I'm a urologist. I, I work at the University of Southern California, and my primary clinical uh, uh, interest is in robotic surgery for, for urologic oncologic operations, uh, mainly bladder, kidney, and prostate cancer. Uh, but I also have a, 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 um, a keen interest in uh, working on emerging uh, aspects of uh, robotic surgery. Uh, these are my uh, financial uh, disclosures. I'm a consultant with with both these companies. And what I'd like to do today is to talk about, you know, what we think about as a conventional robotic system that does laparoscopic surgery, like the intuitive platform, but really uh, foray into some new emerging and novel applications, maybe less complicated, but I think have the potential to create a, a bigger uh, clinical impact, which would be in the field of flexible endoscopic or endoluminal robotics, robotic guided uh, image guided interventions and, and then of course uh, key all this into you know how do we uh, effectively incorporate this into into a clinical practice that is cost effective and, and when one thinks about robotic surgery obviously the da vinci system by intuitive surgical comes to mind it's been around clinically for 20 years yes there have been some uh, uh, modest to uh, moderate uh, innovations over this 20 year period in terms of instruments, energies, technology, architecture, et cetera. But really what has changed is the surgeon's ability to adapt this piece of equipment and really use it into various aspects of, 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 of surgery. It started being popularized with urology, but uh, you know, it's it spread across uh, you know, various, um, various subspecialties. Uh, However, there are some newer systems on the horizon, and I'm not going to go into detail about this. Uh, the first group of, of, of um, uh, um, uh, devices are similar to what Da Vinci does with some modifications where we have some you know, clinical data out there. There are some systems that are specifically designed, including Intuitive's own uh, version, to, to perform single port, single site, typically belly button surgery. And there are some companies whose names are floated around they're there, uh, but we don't have any published uh, clinical data with them. Um, what, and again, without going into details of, of how these things work, uh, th there's going to be a common theme with these newer emerging uh, technologies. Uh, some will provide, for example, the, the, the ALFX from uh, Transcentrix, provide some haptic feedback and has some innovative you know, camera tracking using the, the surgeon's eye movements. Uh, but they're, they're all limited that they're still in the early stage of, of their development, and the development cycle for these uh, technologies is significant. So just to illustrate, you know, they've incorporated this haptic feedback here, but if you ask surgeons who, who use the Da Vinci, most of them don't now feel that the lack of haptic feedback is a problem because they've used visual cues to compensate for it. So, so while sometimes these uh, technologies are cool and novel, their actual clinical use is, is, is really unproven. Uh, the second part that this thing does is that it actually has a sensor that tracks the surgeon's eye movements and actually you can move the camera up, down, right, left by just looking at different parts of the screen and you can also zoom in and out by by head motion. So, uh, you know, again, it's it's cool. It looks, you know, uh, you, know uh, uh, you know, different, but uh, again, does it help the surgeon? Does it help the operation? Does it help the outcome? It, it is not known. And similarly, there are some other uh, early developments. I think if nothing else, uh, these uh, alternate robotic surgical platforms, the least they would do, hopefully, is make the current Da Vinci also cost competitive and therefore be easily adaptable to various healthcare uh, systems. There are some um, you know, news uh, casts about various systems from Japan. I think the verb surgical was very exciting because Google had a significant interest in the data science portion of surgery, uh, but this has now since been acquired by J&J, &J, and we don't know what the future of this is. But independent to commercial units, I think the, and this is the system from Cambridge, the UK system, uh, which again um, is in its now uh, clinical launch. One of the other uh, things that is also happening in parallel is that a lot of labs uh, across, the, uh, across the world are developing certain components of robotic surgery. So while many of these are not designed to be commercial entities on their own, they certainly will create technology like haptics, like optical feedback, using modular arms that are off the shelf arms that you can just buy. And so you significantly reduce the development and production cost 
uh, of these systems and hopefully some of these technologies will 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 translate into um, uh, making this more cost effective now single port surgery uh, came in laparoscopically and this is a, a end result of a donor nephrectomy believe it or not that was done uh, when we were in cleveland uh, entirely through the belly button but again doing it laparoscopically is significantly uh, challenging and so this is again where a robotic platform would help uh, uh, for example uh, this is the the da vinci version of it where through a single 2.5 centimeter cannula you have four robotically controlled instruments that go in including an articulating camera that provides the the triangulation and the view plus two working and one retracting instrument that can move independent of each other and you can move all of them uh, together in one rotation uh, again this is designed for trans abdominal surgery or trans oral surgery but you can imagine something like this in a more flexible format being used inside a hollow organ lumen so again uh, this is how it looks on the outside the current uh, commercial uh, version and just to show you how a intraoperative um, you know assessment looks like this is a radical prostatectomy the the uh, the port is is just above the umbilicus the instruments come in uh, and then you can easily get triangulation that you typically are used to uh, even though the axis of entry is in the is to the same port so again this is uh, making single port surgery slightly more effective uh, not going into the details a meta analysis done again uh, to to brokar's point does this actually create any benefit in terms of conversion rates there was no difference between robotic single surgery to lap uh, uh, conventional laparoscopy laparoscopic single port surgery or conventional robotics but if you look at complication rates, at least uh, compared to the laparoscopic uh, single source site surgery, the robotic procedures had a fewer complications. There is another system out of Canada uh, called Titan Medical. Again, we just have preclinical reports, no actual data, uh, but again, specifically designed to do single port surgery. Now, moving gears, um, you know, everybody is familiar with this manual endoscope, uh, which, um, um, you know, is kind of across all surgical specialties. This happens to be a ureteroscope, but you could certainly put a gastroscope or a bronchoscope in its place. It has an external lever for articulation. It's a, got a long shaft of variable diameter, usually a single uh, working channel. And, and then uh, it, you all the movements are done by the, except for the deflection in one plane, are transmitted by the surgeon from the outside across the small tube to the inside. So if you were to give this to an engineer, they would say that this is the most inefficient way of controlling the tip of a flexible catheter. Now, contrast to this is a system uh, from Hansen Medical, which is an endovascular robotic system, where using a three-dimensional joystick, you can actually actively move the tip of the, uh, of the robotic catheter. And uh, this was done for mainly electrophysiological ablation, and these four rings represent pulmonary vein openings. And you can actually, without any fast pointing or tremors, uh, go to any point on this circle very precisely, stay stable, something that you would be very hard to do uh, mechanically using a manual scope. Now, whether this engineering benefit translates into any clinical benefit, yet needs to be proven, but certainly uh, from an engineering standpoint, from a control standpoint, this is a far superior way of, of controlling a catheter. We actually use this in the, in the lab and in a, a first-in-man clinical trial for treating kidney stones. And now this technology has evolved. Uh, now this company uh, is owned by Johnson & Johnson, where it's a, a modular uh, stand or a bed-mounted system. But what is, what is impressive is that you can miniaturize this. Uh, all, this is entirely robotically controlled. This is the actual scope. And then you can insert, in this case, there was a laser fiber that was inserted that can also be uh, robotically controlled so that you can get precise uh, location of the tip to the patient's anatomy. Again, whether this creates a clinical benefit is, is to be seen. We did do an initial uh, clinical trial with the uh, preclinical version. This was back about five years ago, and a lot of development has occurred since. The system is FDA approved for use in the lung for bronchoscopy, and its urology platform is likely to be launched this year. But just to show that the scope is in, introduced um, uh, in, into the patient, these are the older version of the robotic arms that get locked in. And the actual controlling mechanism, and this is the inside of the bladder, uh, you're seeing the, the view on the, on the screen, and that's the inside of the, going past the prostate to try and access the ureter. It's actually a, a, an Xbox type controller. You know, video game manufacturers have done the best in terms of ergonomics, and so, uh, you know, that was what was used and, and seems to work out the best. 
Uh, and this is what the current system looks like. Uh, this is the urology system with three arms. The bron bronchoscopy system has two arms. Uh, again, just to uh, show how uh, the patient would lie uh, under the fluoroscope. And, and this is how the room setup would be. It's a, it's a sleek uh, floor mounted car. Now just imagine, instead of having just the, the single um, uh, robotic instrument, unfortunately this video is not working, if you had a, a, had a scope and two working hands pass, for example, through the lumen of the stomach or the colon, one could really do endoluminal operations and suturing and dissections in a precise manner. Um, now moving gears to image guided interventions, uh, uh, you know, image guided robotic interventions are not new. You know, you have the cyber knife, which is a, a robotic arm mounted and it delivers precise radiation energy uh, uh, to various anatomy parts. High intensity focused ultrasound where waves are focused on the prostate to kill cancer cells being used. Uh, Prokar mentioned about Mako surgical, which does orthopedic procedures. Now here, instead of being a master slave, slave configuration, instead of the surgeon or the orthopedic surgeon holding the drill, the drill is also attached to a robotic arm and it'll actually tell you which is the correct angle. It will stop you from going too deep or too far and, and once you've registered the anatomy to the patient. And so it does enhance and make these handheld instruments themselves smarter. Uh, to do needle ablation, needle interventions, uh, now you can do, uh, uh, there are systems that use surface markers where you can marry the patient's real anatomy onto a CAT scan and using an iPad type display perform percutaneous interventions. Uh, or you can use a EM sensor. Uh, this is a, a, a study we did uh, at USC with a technology called Translucent Medical where the, um, uh, there are electromagnetic field is created uh, that you know, uh, uh, senses. And, and for example, you can actually have the patient's CT image here uh, being seen as if you're seeing, looking through the patient who's, uh, this is a cadaver model actually, uh, uh, deep in. And then if you wanted to do a percutaneous needle-based intervention, the needle tip actually has an EM sensor. And so does, for example, a catheter inside the kidney. And you can actually marry the two very precisely. And the system will tell you whether the needle angle, depth, et cetera, is accurate. This has been incorporated into uh, performing, for example, prostate biopsies. This is a robotic a prostate biopsy device developed at the Singapore General Hospital that uses MR and ultrasound images to accurately biopsy lesions within the prostate. Taking this one step further, Duke Herrell and the group at Vanderbilt have actually designed deflectable needles. So for example, to go from point A to point B, it doesn't have to be a straight line. You can actually chart out curvilinear lines and use uh, novel needles uh, to get there. Of course, this is easier said than done and a lot of work is happening. So for example, this is a bench type prototype where the steerable flexible needle can go to a precise location uh, using a precise trajectory. And so this may make uh, needle interventions even more sophisticated by, by incorporating these algorithms. Um, uh, you can actually do image guided uh, interventions. This is actually a water jet procedure to ablate BPH where you insert a transurethral device you map out the area to be uh, resected on an ultrasound image, and the system will actually carve out that image using a water jet. And so truly image guided interventions can be automated and, and this field is likely to expand in the future. But what really needs to happen for any of these systems to be cost effective and useful is that number one, they have to be multidisciplinary. You can't just buy a robot for performing kidney stone procedures, et cetera, et cetera. They have to be useful across specialties, they have to be modular so that the cost of development is, is, is lower. They have to incorporate imaging. They have to improve training and have to be multifunctional. Uh, so this is kind of a modular design off the shelf robotic arm. You don't have to develop it. So the cost of development is very low. And like what our cell phones have done, they've, they've made concise or four or five gadgets into one device. That's what newer robotic systems need to do. And they need to be able to overlay, for example, imaging here. That's a kidney tumor here. Uh, and you can overlay uh, imaging there. And similarly, you can use on focal microscopy. Um, uh, and again, uh, Prokar mentioned briefly augmented reality where you can overlay uh, CT images. This is a, a vascular tree being overlaid on a, on a kidney. And this is a, a nerve bundle being overlaid on a prostate. That is something that will uh, help. Uh, we mentioned briefly training. This is a simulator, which is great because when you do an exercise on the simulator, you get a score. The system does the, the tracks your errors, your efficiency, your handling, et cetera. 
But what about real life? If somebody is doing a prostate anastomosis such as this, there have validated questionnaires that can grade it by independent observers, but that means somebody has to watch hours and hours of video of, uh, of residents and trainees doing this. But as Prokar mentioned, now we have the ability of tracking movements and really have the system tell us uh, how a, a surgeon is performing. And this actually has translates also into clinical outcomes. But for any new technology, including robotics to be relevant, it has to show a clinical benefit. It's not just enough to have a cool toy that can do you know, complex maneuvers in the lab. What's the clinical benefit to the patient? What's the cost-effective analysis? Does it make sense? Also, we haven't really truly tapped into the real uh, uh, benefits of remote surgery. You know, you have self-driving cars today, but yet remote surgery after the Lindbergh operation back 20 years ago, when a transatlantic cholecystectomy was done, despite our broadband being better, despite communication channels being better, we haven't really moved that too much. I think it's time. Um, and also with AI algorithms and artificial intelligence, we can also create certain subsets of the operation to be automated. Maybe not the whole thing, but as Prokar mentioned, suturing is a prime example, and we have to incorporate these into clinical practice. But at the end of the day, as has been mentioned, it's not the machine, but it's the man behind the machine that makes this, uh, makes this operation relevant. And I'm gonna stop by, I know it's Glasgow and I know it's Scotland, but yesterday the Indian cricket team beat Australia and I'm still hungover from that. And so with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Abhay. And again, thank you for this uh, opportunity and be happy to answer any questions.